Well, <clears throat> welcome back. Um, we're going to go ahead and get started here. We may be having a, a little bit of uh, technical glitches with YouTube right now, but we'll try to get that back online. Um, welcome to the 157th anniversary of the Battle of Chickamauga, if you haven't joined us already. Um, now we're going to have the live question and answer session with Park Historian Jim Ogden. Feel free to ask questions uh, at this time and, um, and we'll get those answered. Uh, we're sitting in one of, the, uh, one of the offices here in the operations building at Chickamauga Battlefield, um, uh, surrounded by some books and bookcases. And um, in line with the battle, we have the Snodgrass um, house picture behind us with one of the guns, one of the cannon from the 4th U.S. Artillery. So with that, we'll bring Jim Ogden out and we'll start our question and answer session. Um, so get those questions ready. Jim? Thank you, Chris, and welcome uh, back or for those who, who were with us this morning and um, for those who are um, just tuning in now. Um, thank you for joining this program that the National Military Park is conducting to this year virtually recognize the 157th anniversary of the Battle of Chickamauga. All right, so we're going to start. I am off camera I'm just behind you all that are watching Jim right now. Um, I failed to mention that. But um, we're going to start with some questions that we missed um, on the last segment, so maybe we'll, we'll um, get those answered for you, um, you all. So the first question that we have, Jim, is um, was Fort Harker that's in Stevenson, Alabama, there during the Chickamauga campaign? Um, yes, um, Fort Harker in Stevenson, Alabama was um, originally constructed in the summer of 1862 at the time when uh, Union forces initially under Ormsby uh, McKnight Mitchell had occupied North Alabama beginning in, um, in April, um, just after the, uh, the Battle of Shiloh. Um, and at the same time that um, the, what became the Andrews Raid or the Great Locomotive Chase um, unfolded. And as Mitchell's small force spread out over North Alabama to try to defend that large area um, and was supplemented by a few more forces, an effort was made to build fortifications in, um, in Stevenson to defend that important railroad junction. Um, and Fort Harker began to be constructed uh, and in fact there is a photograph from August of 1863 uh, that is taken from the uh, western parapet of Fort Harker looking north um, with the northwest um, uh, corner of the fort and a Union artillery piece in position there and most importantly about that picture in the background you can see um, the, the rail activity and the wagons as Stevenson is then the railhead for Rosecrans' advance on Chattanooga. So um, one of the other questions that came in, Jim, <clears throat> and this is uh, kind of fortuitous that on the 18th, um, Longstreet's uh, troops are going to be arriving. The question is, did adding troops from the Army of Northern Virginia cause or create communication problems for Bragg? The uh, addition of, um, of troops to Bragg's army from the Army of Northern Virginia, um, and uh, in the end, uh, five of nine of Longstreet's brigades will arrive to participate in the battle, um, does create some additional communication issues, particularly um, uh, since Bragg did not know fully how many troops were coming and what the timetable was. Um, he will, um, with the arrival of um, brigades at uh, the railhead at Catoosa Platform, he will actually um, uh, early on September the 18th um, uh, apply a new organization to his army, creating a provisional division for um, Bush or under Bushrod Johnson. Um, that division being created of, um, of Johnson's own brigade, two brigades, Greg and McNair's, that have arrived from the, um, Mississippi, 
and Robertson's Texas Brigade from the first of, um, of Longstreet's troops who were available for use in the field. And two other of Longstreet brigade, uh, brigades are there in Ringgold or near Ringgold um, making r final preparations to take the field, in particular cooking rations. And so uh, this does result in some, um, uh, some changes in organization as a, and as a result communication. Um, John Bell Hood arrives in the afternoon. Longstreet doesn't arrive until 11 p.m. on the um, on the 19th. Um, and uh, the biggest uh, issue, though, with the arrival of these additional troops, as well as those who had come from Mississippi, uh, is that they do not bring transportation with them. Um, and Bragg already short on wagons for moving even the most critical. Um, of supplies directly associated with the battle, ammunition and medical supplies, um, now has to divide his um, uh, s relatively small number of wagons, given the size of his army, amongst an even larger force. Thanks, Jim. Um, last question from our earlier session. Um, can you tell us where the Reeds Bridge Tower stood, as mentioned in Dave Powell's Glory or the Grave? Uh, the, um, the observation tower erected in the early days of the National Military Park in the 1890s was uh, along Reed's Bridge Road uh, within the Chickamauga Battlefield unit of the National Military Park and south of the road. If you um, uh, go out Reed's Bridge Road from the Lafayette Road about a mile to the top of the rise where the commemorative features are for Vanderbeer's Brigade, um, there are some guns for Frank Smith's Battery I, 4th U.S. there, um, and, um, uh, and then the, the tablets for, um, uh, for Vanderbeer's Brigade. And you walk south on that trail, um, you'll intersect with uh, another trail, but if you continue south, um, and, you, and before you reach the um, area of the guns for Church's Battery D, 1st Michigan Light Artillery, uh, the, uh, the tower stood there on that rise. Um, you'll be able to detect that, the ground dropping off um, uh, around, uh, around there. Um, and it provided a, um, a view uh, eastward towards the lower ground, um, uh, around um, Reed's Bridge and Jay's Mill, and then also um, uh, southward. Thanks, Jim. Um, <clears throat> the other question that we have um, starting in this, in this session is how far into the modern town of Fort Oglethorpe would the battle lines have extended, if at all? All right. Well, um, defining the, um, uh, the actual area of the Battle of Chickamauga, um, uh, really depends on your perspective in a number of different ways. Um, uh, many veterans, um, in fact, uh, eventually by the late 1880s as they're creating the National Military Park, probably the majority of the veterans, or at least the majority of you, was that it was possible to define the ground of the Battle of Chickamauga as stretching essentially from Rossville Gap in the north to Lee and Gordon's Mill or even Glass's Mill in the south. Um, and um, and the, um, uh, I believe tomorrow, Chris, you're doing a segment on Glass's Mill. It'll be Sunday morning. Oh, Sunday morning, okay. And, um, and are you focusing more on the, uh, the 19th action there or the we cavalry cover, on the 20th? We'll cover briefly both, what Probably happens both. on the 19th yeah. and on the 20th, right. since, it, since something does happen there on, on both days. Right. The, um, uh, because of the action um, as far south as Glasses Mill, there were veterans who advocated that um, that, that would be part of the Chickamauga battlefield. Um, and, um, and, and there actually was um, a, um, a proposal and an idea once that the, the, the slim portion of the battlefield would extend down there. Um, they, uh, as the National Military Park was created, one of the approach roads did go down to Glasses Mill, and there once were cast iron tablets down there for the action um, on September the 19th. So um, uh, certainly you can say that um, uh, the, the battle lines and the 
um, uh, positions extend into the town of Fort Oglethorpe um, as marked by the commemorative features for the uh, Confederate cavalry on September the 20th along the alignment or historic alignment of the Lafayette Road um, essentially there behind the, uh, the Crystal Restaurant um, uh, today and those businesses along modern Lafayette Road. Uh, but again, uh, many um, uh, of the veterans would have advocated that um, as far north as Rossville Gap um, and certainly to Lee and Gordon's Mill, if not even Glass's Mill, could be considered um, the Chickamauga Battlefield. Thanks, Jim. Um, one of the other questions is, um, what did the family, uh, farmers or families do um, that lived near the Fords on the 18th? Um, were they surprised or were they already gone? Had they vacated the area? Well, the, um, we, uh, we know um, uh, a little bit about, uh, about some of the families um, and it really does um, uh, kind of run the spectrum. Um, the, um, uh, as, as Stewart's division approaches um, uh, 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 Thedford's Ford, um, there's the interaction with, um, um, uh, with Debbie Thedford, um, uh, and that, so that, the th um, uh, but, um, but other um, uh, families, um, we don't um, really have any references to, um, uh, to where they were at that exact moment. Um, the, um, uh, the hunts will try to, um, to, to shelter in, um, in their homes. Um, and fortunately for them, the, the battlefield or the battle action will not be extensive at that point. Um, but, um, but both their homes will become field hospitals. And in some ways, um, uh, that might have been more devastating than, um, than actual battle um, uh, action because of a greater duration. And then just to have all of, um, of that humanity, which has already been, um, been torn by battle, um, cared for um, at that home. Um, other um, uh, other families, um, uh, it's, the evidence suggests that they have already uh, moved away from this area. Uh, we're more than two years into the war by this point. This is not the first time an army-sized force has been in the Chattanooga area. Um, the Army of the Mississippi had been brought here by Bragg in, um, in July. Uh, and August of 1862 um, and civilians were learning you just didn't want to be anywhere near this large body of mostly young men supposedly organized as a military force um, and uh, we there are accounts from soldiers of, um, of marching towards the battlefield and refugees going the opposite direction um, and certainly when you um, read the Atlanta newspapers or accounts of civilians um, in other places in North Georgia, particularly along the rail line, um, they relate the, uh, the flood of refugees headed south um, from what now is clearly going to be the scene of action in Northwest Georgia. So one of the other questions that came in is, um, in the days prior to Chickamauga, um, how worn in regards to fatigue were Breckenridge, was Breckenridge's division? Um, in other words, how far had they marched prior to the battle? Um, I know they were not in Tullahoma, but they came from the Yazoo expedition, and so that was, that was one of the questions about fatigue. How fatigued were, were Breckenridge's troops? Well, Breckenridge's men um, uh, had been in Mississippi. They'd been sent to Mississippi in the latter part of May in response to the threat to Vicksburg, um, an effort by the Confederates to try to create an army, um, uh, an army of relief um, as uh, eventually it is seen under Joe Johnston to try to uh, break the siege of Vicksburg. Um, and they had, um, had then uh, seen some action around Jackson after the fall of Vicksburg and had then spent the, uh, the, the summer, um, the latter part of July and the first part of uh, most of August um, in Vicksburg, which they found not a very satisfying experience. Um, the heat, um, the environmental conditions, 
they were, um, uh, were actually quite pleased when they got the orders in late August to, um, uh, to move to the train stations um, to head back to the east. Um, they, um, uh, once arriving back in the Chattanooga area in the, um, at uh, Chickamauga Station, um, they really don't march a great deal of distance um, when Bragg retreats out of Chattanooga on September the 7th, 8th, and, um, and 9th. Um, Breckenridge's division, as part of Hill's Corps, will march south on the Lafayette Road. Um, uh, the, uh, the division uh, obviously um, has got a few uh, command and control problems. Um, the, uh, the first part of their march is not very um, well conducted, but um, they'll march down to Lafayette and will actually stay in the Lafayette area really until um, the march north uh, beginning on September the 17th. So they've really not marched a great deal of distance, but um, they are um, handicapped uh, by the fact that they uh, were not allowed to bring any of their wagons with them. Um, and in fact, um, John Jackman of the uh, 9th Kentucky um, has got a great account of, um, of being in charge of a detail, um, uh, shepherding their baggage to the rear by, um, by rail. Um, uh, in the day, in the week or so before the um, before the battles. Um, the other part was um, a logistical question: um, How well supplied with ammunition was Bragg? In general, by the end of the first day of fighting, would you have been drawing ordnance from Atlanta? But the um, uh, they really weren't in a position to um, uh, to on that short a notice draw ammunition from Atlanta. You've got the issue of um, of bringing it up on um, on the rail cars. Um, the um, uh, there had been ammunition concerns in the um, the weeks before the battle. In fact. Um, uh, Benjamin Franklin Cheatham, one of the division commanders in Polk's Corps, will actually send his brother, John, who is serving him as ordnance officer to Atlanta um, to try to get some additional ammunition to increase the amount of ammunition that is carried in the wagons um, of Cheatham's division. Um, the, um, uh, again, transportation is really the biggest problem. Um, being able to carry a sufficient quantity of ammunition. There isn't any real issue that, um, that they run out of or run short on ammunition. Um, uh, they do have enough for what turns out to be the Battle of Chickamauga, uh, but there, uh, there is this issue that they really don't uh, or aren't able to carry enough ammunition for two battles or three battles. Um, and, um, and then to, to resupply the, uh, the wagons um, uh, from the railroad afterwards is um, a, a, a little bit of a chore as well. Um, so the wheeled vehicle transportation, the wagons in particular, that becomes um, uh, really the biggest problem. Uh, they don't really run out of ammunition in the battle, uh, but, uh, but having any um, uh, any surplus right readily available is um, is uh, is an issue. Um, when um, uh, when Forrest is sent by Bragg um, on the um, uh, the the orders come late on the 24th um, and they move on the 25th of September um, to counter uh, federal forces from Burnside's command who are coming down from Knoxville and have gotten um, to the Hiawassee River and had um, actually sent. Um, troops into Cleveland. Um, uh, Forrest, for whatever reason, um, having been actively engaged until the 22nd and 23rd, um, his men um, on the 23rd and 24th um, have not had an opportunity to resupply with, uh, with ammunition. And one of Forrest's complaints will be, um, be a shortage of ammunition. And that seems to be more an issue of getting his men directly associated with their own wagons to then fill up their cartridge boxes from the wagons as opposed to a shortage of ammunition. So, um, let's see what we have 
here. Um, if if anyone has any additional questions to to, to send to Jim, please do so right now. Um, but I have one here that we're going to, to give to Jim while we may be waiting for some additional um, folks to come in here, um, dealing with the 18th of September also. Um, how do you say that Nathan Bedford Forrest did in the campaign up to and during the Battle of Chickamauga? Well, Forrest, um, as, as most folks or many folks know, is certainly a man of action. Um, he, um, uh, he, he loved to, um, uh, to fight, and, um, and in the, um, uh, the days um, uh, leading up to the, uh, to the battle, um, including with the Confederate retreat from, um, from Chattanooga on September the 7th, 8th, and 9th, uh, Forrest's command is, um, uh, is very active. Uh, Forrest, um, on September the 3rd, had had his command enlarged from just one division to two divisions, essentially making a 2nd Cavalry Corps within Bragg's army. Uh, Forrest having been given command of three brigades of cavalry from uh, Buckner's uh, uh, District of East Tennessee. The, um, um, the, and Forrest's um, um, aggressiveness and activity is noted by, um, uh, by Braxton Bragg um, and, um, and a frustrated um, Braxton Bragg, uh, frustrated with um, uh, Joseph Wheeler's um, uh, role as Cavalry Chief and Cavalry Corps Commander. Uh, Bragg actually, as he retreats south, will order Forrest to take one of his divisions and ride all the way from the rear of the army uh, southward to Wheeler sector and, um, and even take, potentially take command of, um, of Wheeler's cavalry and um, go out and do Wheeler's job. Uh, find the, um, uh, the federal force coming over Lookout Mountain in the area of, um, of Alpine. And, um, and Forrest will actually reach um, uh, Wheeler's sector um, and prepare to conduct that mission when Bragg then orders him back north um, to the area of Lafayette and then on to the, the rear of the army once again. Um, and, um, and, and Forrest um, will ride hard um, uh, in, in conducting um, all of these movements. Um, so he's generally done a good job when not handicapped by Bragg himself um, by the ever-changing mission. Bragg seems at times to, um, to not understand um, the rate at which um, horse-mounted soldiers can move um, across the countryside. Um, the, um, and then on, um, on September the 18th, uh, Forrest has the responsibility of screening Hill and Polk's corps front as they move up and confront Federals on West Chickamauga Creek upstream or to the south of Lee and Gordon's Mill and at the same time screen the advance of Buckner's corps and Walker's corps and the just created provisional division of Bushrod Johnson as they advance towards the designated crossing points on West Chickamauga Creek, plus operate himself on the line of Dyer's Bridge or Dyer's Ford to cross the creek um, and cover the Rossville Ringgold Road and the rear of the army with one of the forgotten brigades of the campaign, George Hodges' Brigade of Kentucky and Virginia troops. Um, so Forrest is, threat, is spread very thin on the 18th, um, and this then has a factor um, to, um, to then what happens um, late on September the 18th and um, uh, in the pre-dawn hours and uh, right at dawn on September the 19th. Um, that will, um, will have an effect on the course of the battle on the 19th. Uh, but I don't want to give that too much of that away right now because um, I think I see by the schedule there's um, a talk on that tomorrow. So. Um, one of the other uh, questions that came in was, um, well, actually two more. 
how did Joe Brown react to the battle? Um, in other words, was he able to consolidate additional support in his state um, to uh, after the battle? Um, so that's not Joe Brown, folks. Yeah. Maybe. Um, so that that was the big question about Joe Brown is is how did Joe Brown react to to the battle? Um, the, Joe Brown, um, who's being referenced, is um, uh, is the governor of the state of Georgia, um, and um, uh, Joe Brown, um, throughout the um, the entire um, Confederate experiment, will be um, concerned about threats to the state of Georgia. Um, uh, initially, from initially from the um, uh, from the coast. Um, and, um, and then, um, uh, with the approach of Federals from, um, uh, from the North. And when Bragg had retreated back on Chattanooga in July, um, uh, from Middle Tennessee, um, Joe Brown became very concerned about the proximity of, um, uh, of Yankees to the Empire State. Um, the um, um, uh, the um, Brown has um, has already, um, as a result of Abel Strait's threat to the Western Atlantic Railroad in late April and early May, has already moved the Georgia State Line, its two regiments, to the line of the Western Atlantic Railroad to defend um, you know, the bridges along um, that vital state asset and Confederate asset. Um, and now, with the direct threat on Chattanooga, he mobilizes another portion of the Georgia State Force, um, part of the Georgia Reserves. Um, but they are only um, in, uh, in mid-September, they are only starting to get organized. However, there is a component of them um, organizing at Rome, which is doing some patrolling and scouting, out to the west and northwest of Rome, Georgia, um, at the time of the um, of the battle, um, uh, he has a, has sent his adjutant general Henry Wayne um, to um, to strengthen the fortifications on the Western Atlantic Railroad um, and to um, um, uh, to to look at other measures that will um, uh, potentially. Um, help defend Northwest Georgia, but at the same time, um, he um, uh, he is not fully cooperating with Braxton Bragg. Um, uh, he only reluctantly um, agrees to allow uh, Medical Director of Hospital Samuel Stout to make use of Georgia State buildings in Marietta, in particular the Georgia Military Institute um, uh, buildings. So um, the, the, the relationship um, between Brown and the Confederate government um, continues to be one of, um, of some contention, um, uh, even as this threat of, um, of Yankees um, uh, in the Empire State manifests itself in, um, in early September. Thanks, Jim. Um, one last one that I saw come through here deals with the wounded. Logistically, how did the wounded get moved off the field? And especially, you know, this today as on September 18th, as the battle begins, um, how do we see, begin seeing the, the wounded that, uh, that, that begin to, to come about? How do they get moved um, off the battlefield? Well, the, um, uh, by this um, uh, period in the war, both armies have, um, have generally very well organized um, uh, medical capabilities within their commands. And following immediately behind the, uh, the regiments, brigades, and divisions um, are medical personnel. Um, and um, uh, in the Confederate Army, the medical operation is still um, uh, largely organized at the brigade level, however, um, uh, most brigade um, medical operations 
are co-locating themselves um, with the others of their division. Uh, in the Union Army, the medical operation is entirely now organized at the division level. Um, there's a division um, uh, uh, chief surgeon, um, uh, division medical director, and, um, and all of the other uh, medical personnel now work directly under that person and they create a division field hospital. And so as um, evidence of, um, uh, of combat operations um, manifest itself on September the 18th, these medical directors at the division and on the Confederate side, division and brigade level, immediately begin look for, looking for places to establish field hospitals. Um, and as necessary, we'll do so um, and we'll treat the wounded that, that who then come in. Um, and it is their hope then that they can transport those wounded um, on further to the rear um, as quickly as possible, both for the care of those wounded and to free up those medical assets to then potentially move um, uh, to stay in close proximity to their commands. Um, and, um, and this is, um, is done. Uh, however, a unit that is in motion um, is going to have that added um, uh, challenge of, um, of moving wounded soldiers um, uh, the, um, uh, when Wilder's Brigade is engaged at, um, at Alexander's Bridge, um, some of his wounded will wind up being carried by ambulances into um, Thomas J. Wood's sector at um, Lee and Gordon's Mill, um, and then being sent on back towards Crawfish Springs where um, field hospitals um, are being established or, uh, um, or have been already established. Um, but, um, but the wounded are, try, are as quickly as possible try to move to the, uh, to the rear. And it only, that only becomes more difficult when the number of um, casualties increases dramatically on September the 19th. Um, and, um, and that is when you then begin to see some problems with, um, with handling the sheer number of casualties. All right, thanks Jim. Um, let me check here. I don't see any others that have come in. Um, hold on, just one second. Um, so, can one other one other one just came in here? Um, where was McNair's brigade on the 18th, um, and where did the brigade first arrive on the battlefield? Um, McNair's brigade is, um, is one of those that is sent from Mississippi as reinforcements to, um, to Bragg's army. Um, it is one of the two last coming with, um, with Gregg's um, uh, brigade and, um, and they were, um, uh, were loaned um, by, um, uh, by Joe Johnston to Bragg um, what, on what is supposed to be um, a very short-term basis. And uh, Johnston originally thought they would only be going as far as Atlanta to potentially help defend Atlanta should Federals um, approach Atlanta. But when they reach Atlanta, they are sent north on the uh, Western Atlantic Railroad um, to the end of the railroad at Catoosa Platform and they then become one of the brigades in the just created provisional division under Bushrod Johnson. And will march with Johnson um, from Ringgold on the morning of September the 18th, first marching southwestward under the orders that Johnson had previously, but then being turned by Bragg to march westward towards Reed's Bridge. And when uh, Forrest Cavalry screening Johnson's advance, um, and Johnson's own advance encounters Federals um, from Minty's Brigade in the area of, um, of Three Notch Road or what they call the Graysville Lafayette Road. That's where Lee's, uh, Lee's right, video was right, this Right, where morning. Lee's program was this morning. Um, the, uh, uh, another landmark is Peeler's Mill for that. Um, and Johnson um, is forced to deploy troops 
McNair's brigade will be deployed on the right of Fulton's brigade, which is um, on the uh, on the road. Gregg's brigade on the left of Fulton, and those three brigades then will advance westward from the area of Peeler's Mill across Peavine Creek over um, uh, Peavine Ridge um, and on to um, to Reed's Bridge. Um, and then we'll cross the creek at Reed's Bridge and then continue with uh, Johnson's command, then under Hood, um, southward uh, towards the Alexander Farmstead and, um, and Liam Gordonsville, only making it as far as the intersection with the roads going down to Dalton and Thedford's Fords. All right. Thanks, Jim. Um, we appreciate everyone uh, that joined us this afternoon. And um, we will hopefully see everyone again um, at 1045 in the morning. So as you watch the videos uh, this afternoon, this evening, we have another one at 4 o'clock, uh, a short video this, e this afternoon. And then this evening at 8 o'clock, we have another short video. And then at 7 a.m. is when we'll kick off tomorrow morning. We'll have videos at 7 a.m. And then Jim will be back on at 10 in the morning followed by 1045, another uh, live Q&A with Jim Ogden right here at Chickamauga Battlefield. Thanks, thanks, Jim. Thank you, Chris.